we can't go any further without investing some money, alas. I don't know how we can get any further without the Macmillan Bible Atlas, which is the best of the Bible Atlases, or atlases in general. Even if you share them, I think we need to make an order and get some books. Um, anybody who's in the least serious about studying the Bible has got to have the most recent edition of the Owen and Aharoni's The Land of the Bible. It's absolutely essential if you want to know anything other than just your own opinion to be able to read this book. Now we have some time between now and the middle of January. I think we need to have somebody collect money. We'll find out what the current, we're we'll looking, uh, we have a librarian here. Will you look in books and print and see how much these currently cost? Uh, I don't know. Um, we we'll want to actually get an order in. This will give us time to do that and get these books back so that when we get into the, the real stuff, after we get into Deuteronomy and get to the real complicated stuff, the real theology, we want to be able to move without a problem. Now, all right, so that. Israel as we left off. Where were they? Yeah. And they're, wa they're wandering, right? Forty years of wilderness wandering. Now, we have to be careful now about our standard phrasing. First of all, they weren't wandering most of the time. What were they doing? Camped. Yes, they were camped where? At an oasis. At an oasis. Yeah, and then when they went somewhere, they weren't watering then either. Where were they going? To the next oasis. And, and what were they on in between? The road. Yeah. Because the whole area was filled with roads then, many of which are paved over now. Same road. Why? Because roads tended to follow the contours of geography, and like New England, right? Just follow Route 9, just following the old Indian path, 
right? You just follow the road the Indians had across Massachusetts. If you drive down Route 9, it's the same road. It's paved over now. It varies here and there. Why? There were some places due to modern technology that it's easier to build a bridge over the valley rather than go up to the nearest ford and come back down. So it's not exactly, but the roads pretty much follow the track of the ancient roads. Okay. So the whole idea of wandering in the wilderness, they weren't even in the wilderness. Yes, I know that it says wilderness, but that's that's a, a good Hebrew word for step. S-T-E, yeah, P-P-E, the, the, the semi-arid area where you can keep flocks. Think of, think of the American Southwest, don't think of the Sahara. Do you understand the difference? One's very populated and livable if you know how to live there, and the other is uninhabitable. Now, as a result, we've got to... They weren't even wandering in the sense of moving around aimlessly, even though they knew where they were going. Going from one place to another that was known along a road isn't wandering, but even going from A to B wasn't wandering. Why did they move? Well, the cloud went up. That's the theological reason. But why did they move? Why did the cloud go up? That's a different reason. Why? Yes, because it was time in the agricultural season for them as herdsmen to move. Right? The herdsman takes preference over the farmer, Cain and Abel. Right? The preference of Israel for Israel's anti-city anti-farmer pro-herdsman stance is its early stance. Why? Because the patriarchs and Israel right up to, to the time of the monarchy was what? Was nomadic. Oh, wait a minute, there's 300 years in there between the entry into Canaan and the monarchy. Why did I say right up to the time of the monarchy? Because most of Israel right up to the time of the monarchy was still following the patriarchal idea of non-city, herd, dwelling, movement, back and forth. Okay? They weren't settled in cities even then. So, no. That's a lot on the southern area there. Now that's, that's where the rift opens up and you've got the uh, ocean. Right. And then we have this great rift, right? Well, I've mentioned this rift before, haven't I? What was it? Fault line. Yeah, it's a fault line. It goes down along the east coast of Africa and comes out of Lake Victoria, one of the longest faults in the world. And here the plates are pulling apart and Obviously, this is sea level, right? That's fairly obvious. That's where it dips up above the level of the ocean. Okay. Now, it goes up here to about 750 feet, and then it drops back down past the sea level, and eventually we get to the uh, Dead Sea. Yeah. Yeah. Now where had they been? They had been over here on the one of the roads at one of the major I'm gonna put Katie's down just a little further. I'm gonna put a little south of the Dead Sea because in fact that's where it is. Okay, where are you here? On the surface of the Dead Sea, where are you? What level are you at? 1,100 feet below sea level. Below sea level. Yeah. You been there? Oh, yeah. It's a nasty place. It's the only place where you go in the water and feel like you should take a bath afterwards. But there's no 
actually there's no place to take a bath because that's the only only water in the area. A million two hundred thousand gallons of water evaporate off its surface a day, leaving behind everything else. Which is why it's the Dead Sea, there aren't any fish. Which is also why you can sit in it and read the newspaper. You can even be thin and sit in it and read the newspaper. <laughs> Some of us can sit in it and read the newspaper anyway, but that's not what I mean. I mean, you can be thin and sit in it. Now, they were at Kadesh, and uh, obviously, we're, we've got here a pair of mountain ranges, in fact. Kadesh is walking through the, one of the valleys by it. And these mountains <coughs> are part of the whole story. Right? Now what do we have over here? After we after we pass this plateau kind of area, what's out here? Desert. Yeah, this is the Great Arabian Desert. Head off this direction and you'll eventually come to Saudi Arabia. If you go that way, if you go that way, you'll come to Iraq. But there were tracks eventually that crossed the desert. Um, camel tradesmen did cross the desert from time to time. Now, right along the plateau, but not at the edge of the desert, right along the plateau, in the simplest uh, way possible, there was a road. Where did this road go? Not surprisingly, it went to the port of Elat. Where was it headed when it went that way? Damascus. Yes, to Damascus, of course. It goes up to Amman to Damascus. Amman, the capital of the Ammonites, to Damascus. All right? Now, this road then parted here, one went south to the Sinai Peninsula. And the other division of it went west. Where'd it go? Egypt. Egypt. Of course. Yeah. Now, there was another way to cross here, just south of the Dead Sea. You could cross down into the Arabah and up, and over past Kadesh and head toward the ocean, and meet the road that went along the ocean. The Via Maris, the ocean road of the, the, the Romans call it Via Maris, just the ocean road. What was this road called here? Oh, you know this. What was this road called? What? The road to Damascus. It is called the road to Damascus in some parts of the Old Testament. Not an inspired answer, but a correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> This is the King's Highway that we're reading about in Numbers. Now, there was, in addition, uh, oh, and of course, it would, it would come as no shock to you at all to know that there was a road that went along the bottom of the rift. Yeah, so there was a, a, a lesser road that went along the bottom of the rift. And here, what did it do here? It divided go on this side, go up to Jericho, you go on this side, of course, and you've got parallel roads going along here. These roads, too, are still here. Alright? Now, uh, there are a number of rivers that flow off of this plateau into the lowland, and they have roads along them too. Okay, we'll put the rivers in the mall. There's a couple of more important points that are significant here. There's one more road to the east that is of significance to our story. It breaks off right about here, and it goes along out to the lesser road. Obviously, it's a road that 
uh, camel caravan years to follow, moving things as fast as possible without going to a lot of cities. This is a road along the edge of the desert. The, this is really skirting the edge of the desert. Uh, there were a series of forts there because there was always the danger to this settled area that people could infiltrate from the desert, and they did all the time. So this had a series of fort fortresses along it. And who used those fortresses? Well known to us, we connect this line of forts on the, on the very eastern edge of our story with whom? He made his mad dash from here north along this road that nobody expected him to come to and took Damascus from the Turks and beat the English and the French and the Americans there. Who am I thinking of? Lawrence. Lawrence of Arabia. This is the road that made him famous, this outer road. Okay. Israel has been, oh no. We've got a couple of other uh, things. There is a road, not surprisingly, uh, the way from the hill country, from the Old Testament, it goes down here, from Kadesh. Okay, and of course there is a road north from Kadesh, and we have that picture when they tried to conquer Arad here. Remember this? King of Arad, they went out without the ark and so forth. Can we put in some other cities? What city would be right here? Jericho. Jericho, sure. Uh, I, I drew the river in just on the deception if you know this. What river is this? Jericho. That's the Jordan. The Jordan is 90 miles from the Sea of Galilee or the Sea of Kinneret down to the Dead Sea, but of course it actually flows 150 miles. What is that? It winds around and around and around here. Yeah. Okay. For purposes of our story, the road goes up from Jericho to the city at the top of the mountain range, which we now know as Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And let's put in the, the great city of the Ammonites, Rabbah Avon. Rabbah just meaning the great city. This is the great one. The Shina was the the capital of Jordan. All right. Now there's some other, some other uh, interesting things here. Uh, as to divisions, what countries occupied these sites in our story? Well, we know that this whole area over on this side, over on this side was the Egyptian province of, this was the Egyptian province of Canaan. This was the southern border. This was Canaan. We know this in Genesis 10. What is Genesis 10? The table of the nation. We notice in Genesis 10 that Canaan was a son of Ham. Right? And Ham is Egypt. Okay. And the reason, now these Canaanites, of course, were seven. They were not ethnically related to the Egyptians. But we've long since dismissed the idea that genealogies in the ancient world represent what? Biological relationships. They sometimes do. Just saying that genealogies sometimes represent biological relationships tells you everything, doesn't it? It means that what? They usually don't. Whereas we think of genealogies as exclusively biological, which is not what they were used for in the ancient world at all. When the writer of Genesis 10 made Canaan a son of Ham, 
he was telling you that the province of Canaan was part of the Egyptian Empire. Okay? Now, over here was not part of the Egyptian Empire. Basically, it's just the country was too rugged and too wild, and because in here, oddly enough, there was enough water to support scrub forest that was quite thick on this side. There was more water in those days than there is now. You don't get forest here or over here either now. Uh, this forest in the southern area here, first of all, the, the mountains themselves, I'll show you some pictures of it, and the clay makes you think of South Georgia. Why? It's red. And the mountains with this thick scrub forest were considered hairy, red, hairy. Is that again? Yeah. Is that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who was red and hairy? Edom. Esau, whose name was Edom, Edom. because Edom means red. red. Yes. It, well, his other name was Seir, which means Herod. Isn't it lucky that he looked just like the country that had his name? <laughs> this might make you wonder about a certain set of details about him. In any case, in any case, we have a river that flows roughly in this direction from out of the wilderness. And it distinguished the area on the south from Moab. We have the the, the rivers, the Zered River and the Arden River, and in here we have Moab. And who's north of them? Well, yeah, Rabba Man is the Amorite. You can't make it any anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't spell Amorite either. <laughs> uh, we're going to get a sick teacher here fast. Okay, um, now of course, you remember, this all looks like Genesis, doesn't it? Because Genesis told us all about Edom and its relation to Jacob, Hype, and Israel. And Moab and Ammon. Now, who were Moab and Ammon? Uh, Lot? Children's sons. Sons. Well, his, yes, that's right. His, his son type and grandson. That's right. Um, and that was a... Okay. So this is the Arnon, which figures in our story. And this is the Zerah, D-E-R-E-T which figures in our story. Alright. And then just off the map up here is the the Wadi Zerka where we have uh, Elisha's being fed by ravens which divide Ammon from Gilead. Right? Gilead which is the long name of Gad. Right? Gad, Gilead. Think of them as the same place. This is all in Transjordan. And this is not Canaan yet. They're down here on the border of Canaan, they're going along, they're not in Canaan yet. Because Canaan is the Egyptian Empire. Alright. Now, let's see here. Uh, let's go back to Numbers 20. We had talked about the we had talked about the exclusion of Moses. Where he says now verse fourteen. Moses sent messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom 
Thus says your brother Israel, which is a clear harking back to Genesis. The book of Exodus, I said before, presupposes the existence of Genesis. And I have said the book of Numbers presupposes what? The existence of Genesis and Exodus. Yes. Deuteronomy doesn't assume anything. <laughs> all right, now. You brother Israel, you know all the adversity that has befallen us, how our fathers went down to Egypt and we dwelt in Egypt a long time and the Egyptians dealt harshly with us and our fathers and when we cried to Yahweh, he heard our voice and sent an angel. I don't have to read any further before I know what cycle or tradition of stories I'm reading from. What am I reading from? What cycle or tradition of stories am I reading from? Identify the cycle by a structure. He sent an angel. Some of the plagues says God came. Some of the plagues say an angel came. Some of the story says God was going to send an angel to guide them and others says God went with them. Now, distinguish between the two. What is it? One cycle, what? No, no, they're both in Exodus. One is Aaronite, one is Mushite, distinguished by... Distinguished by... Who went with them. Yes, distinguished by two, who went with them. But I have chosen, for simplicity's sake, to identify the two cycles by two structures. The messenger would be Mushite, yes. And how have I decided to identify the Mushite cycle? Moses 10, yes, as opposed to the sanctuary. Well, they were both called ten of meeting, so we can't use ten of meeting as a distinction. All right? All right. This is the cycle of Mushite stories that we identify with the ten of meeting stories. Right? Sent an angel and brought us forth out of Egypt. And here we are in Kadesh, a city on the edge of your territory. Now let us pass through your land. We will not pass through field or vineyard, neither will we drink water from a well. We will go along the king's highway. We will look at the map. We will not turn aside to the right or the left until we pass through your territory. But Edom said to him, You shall not pass through, lest I come out with a sword against you. And the people of Israel said to him, We will go up by the highway. And if we drink of your water, I and my cattle, then we'll pay for it. Let me only pass through on foot, nothing more. But he said, You shall not pass through. And Edom came out against them with many men and with a strong force. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his territory, so Israel turned away from him. As opposed to every other time this happens, where what happens as a result? Somebody sends a force against Israel, and what? A holy war is ordered. God promises that he'll lead out in the holy war. Destruction ensues. There's obviously the impossibility of holy war against Edom. Why? Brothers. Jacob and Esau are what? The covenant, yes, they're part of the covenant people. And they can't be touched because of the covenant. That's part of the universal, universal idea of Israel. There are two different strains. Now you've gotten used to this annoying reality of the Bible that the Bible sometimes tells you two things. There are two different strains about the election of Israel in the Old Testament and they're quite persistent. Either God is the God of Israel and the other nations he's allotted to the other gods, right? Right? And he's the God of Israel. He elected Israel and these others are just out there. Or the universal approach, he's the God of what? All the nations. And therefore you have all oh, distinctions even in the text. Uh, what, why is God sending, giving Israel the land? What would be one answer? He promised it to Abraham. Yeah. In Deuteronomy 9, and we're going to spend a long time on this. This is a big deal. But Deuteronomy 9, not today, but when we get to Deuteronomy, 
this is a big deal now. It's a ma it becomes a major, 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 major issue. It's still a question Adventists have, and therefore it's an important one. Hear, O Israel, you are to pass over the Jordan this day to go in to dispossess nations greater and mightier than yourselves, cities great and fortified up to heaven, a people who are great and tall, the sons of the Anakim, whom you know and whom you have heard it said, who can stand before the sons of Anak. Know therefore this day that he who goes over before you as a devouring fire is Yahweh your God. He will destroy them and subdue them before you. So you shall drive them out and make them perish quickly as Yahweh has promised to you. Do not say in your heart, after Yahweh your God has thrust them out before you, it is because of my righteousness that Yahweh has brought me in to possess this land. Whereas it is because of the wickedness of these nations that Yahweh is driving them out before you. That's a different thing. What does that say? It's not the election of Israel. It's what? It's the failure to keep covenant correctly of the prior nations that God is punishing them because they failed to keep covenant with him. He's driving them out and bringing another ancient nation in to fill the gap. And the clear implication is, and this is exactly what the Deuteronomist is going to say, and therefore if Israel fails to keep the covenant, what? God will drive you out and bring another nation in, and there's no election there at all. That has nothing to do with election. That has to do with God's universal control of all nations, playing off one nation against another. That's not election. Okay, we'll come to the where the remnant comes from in Deuteronomy too. Not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart are you going in to possess their land, but because of the wickedness of these nations that Yahweh your God is driving them out before you, and that he may confirm a covenant word which he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it's almost like, what is it? The election part, the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is what? It's sort of, oh, it's an afterthought. Oh, he, oh yes, and also so that he can fulfill that election business. That's like, uh, and the Deuteronomist does that very deliberately. You see, what? We'll, we'll talk about the theology of Deuteronomy at great length, but the Deuteronomist knows that Israel thinks we are the covenant people we have been elected. Therefore, what? No matter what happens, yes, no matter what happens, God will save us and keep us on the covenant land because he gave it to us by election, by grace, no covenant of law. That's not true. Because well, it's not, God, it's not God's law that's at issue here. It's people's response. The question was whether or not God had made a promise that was unconditional. That was the question. No, never. He, he never makes a promise that's unconditional? Okay, now, the question then is, you see the problem that Deuteronomy's face. If you believe you've got an unconditional promise from God, then let the Assyrians invade, let the Babylonians bring on their best what? Doesn't matter. Yeah, we yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be here. But the Deuteronomist started out right from the beginning with words in Moses' mouth that God didn't, isn't bringing you into this land because of your righteousness. He's not bringing you into this land because he elected you. He's bringing you into this land, why? Be because fire nations are wicked. Yes. This brings up an interesting point, at least from the educational background which I have received, which is there was no other kinds of people out there that God was actually trying to dealing with, only the Hebrew and people. Well, that is, of course, the whole side of the story that says Israel was the elect. There was the elected nation and all the other heathen nations. You have, of course, the question of how did the God who created the whole world sort of dismiss most of the human race? 
and elect one. And of course, that's exactly what a strand of Israel theology taught. Here's election, there's us, and the rest of the world. Right? And well, one part of it does. Well, wait a minute, we're studying the Bible. One part of the Bible talks about election. And another part says what? God's running the world. And Israel is one piece of the puzzle. What I meant by that was that the Bible is written from the Israelite perspective. Sometimes. The passage we just read isn't. Right, well that, that's, <laughs> a, that's where, where I was coming from, that it seems to bring out something that isn't very often stressed. That there was possibly covenant that God had with somebody other than you will be appalled at how often, when, when, now that we're reading it verse by verse, the other side of the coin turns up of God's relation to the other nations. We're in a passage about that right now in Numbers. We just came to a passage. Israel needed to go along the king's highway. They really did. And Edom said, no. And God said, well, the only thing to do is turn, go back, go down. They came from Kadesh. They were here. He sent messages along the road to the king of Edom. But my people are ready to come. And Edom said no. So God said what? Go down here, get on the road, go up here, take off from there, Go along the wilderness road outside the territory of Edom because the Edomites don't want you there. And how does that fit with the theology of an all-powerful God who could mow down any in front of them? It fits in this way. God had a relationship to Edom and he didn't want the Edomites dis disturbed by the Israelites and so if the Edomites make a decision that you're not to enter their territory, then what? Then you don't. Okay, now, let's see where we're going from here. Um, so, it says, verse 21, Edom refused to give Israel passage through his territory, so Israel turned away from him. And they journeyed from Kadesh, and the people of Israel, uh, the people of Israel, the whole congregation, came to Mount Hor. We don't know which of these mountains in the southern area is Mount Hor, there is, of course, a traditional Mount Hor. There's a traditional one of all of these places. You understand that. But whether it's the real thing or not is something else. The so Mount Hor on the border of the land of Edom. Aaron shall be gathered to his people, for he shall not enter the land which I have given the people of Israel because you rebelled against my command at the waters of Meribah. The denial of Aaron's entry on the border of Edom is the real signal of the end of the Exodus generation. Moses is left alive to make the final preparations, but with Aaron, the, the, the wilderness generation is gone. That's what this signals here. Take Aaron and Eliezer, his son, and bring them up to Mount Hor, and strip Aaron of his garments, and put them on Eliezer, his son, and Aaron shall be gathered to his people, and he shall die there. We talked about this gathering to you people being a literal gathering. Moses did as Yahweh commanded, and they went to Mount Hor in the sight of the congregation. And Moses, uh, this is really a pathetic picture, stripped Aaron of his garments. Can you, can you, can you picture this? Uh, Aaron leaving, knowing that he's going to die, and that they're not coming back with him. His brother, his son there with him. Um, Eliezer, his son, and Aaron died there on top of the mountain. Then Moses and Eliezer came down from the mountain, and when all the congregation saw that Aaron was dead, all the house of Israel wept for Aaron thirty days. Okay? So, we have the near end of the cycle here. The Canaanite, the king of Aaron. See where Aaron is? who dwelt in the Negev, which is just the southern area of, of Judah, heard that Israel was coming by the way of the Atharim. He fought against Israel and took some of them captive. 
Israel vowed a vow to Yahweh and said, If thou wilt indeed give this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And Yahweh hearkened to the voice of Israel and gave over the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. So the name of that place was Forma. From, of course, Kerem, which is devoted or votive offering. Anything Kerem has to be killed and burned by fire. It's a votive offering to Yahweh. Right? Everybody clear? Remember we studied the thing about vows at the end of Leviticus? That anything vowed was Kerem. That's what this word is here. In contrast to Edom. Contrast that to the treatment of Edom. Okay. Now then. So where is the traditional pathway? I mean, they weren't going up near here, they were down. <laughs> no, but you see, if the king of Arad controlled, there was a. I believe King Persia was right here. Although it doesn't. The well is here. And there's a road. If they, were, if they were moving this way or this way, it's about here too. If they were moving over here, they were near his territory. They had already made an approach to the south before. What was the king of Barry worried about? He, yeah, he was trying to take a preemptive strike and thereby cause himself troubles that were unnecessary. <laughs> yes. All right, now. <coughs> Where's my whore? I don't know. Somewhere in this area. I don't even know which side of the Arabah it's on. Neither does anybody else. The traditional Mount Hor is on that side over there near Petra. Uh, let's see. From Mount Hor, they set out by way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom the people became impatient on the way. Now see, they were going down to a lot. So they, they went down this way now. Um, what do you think caused their impatience? Well, you're not exactly going backwards. You're going around. You're going around a long way to get there. You're, you're there, basically, and you're going around. I. Aaron was dead. It was time to go on. Yeah, I think they were impatient to get on with it. They're moving down here, and then they're going to go all the way up there and over. Uh, I think they were annoyed, probably, at the Edomite reaction, making making a, making it a lot more difficult to accomplish what they wanted to accomplish. They were probably already annoyed at that. Then they're okay. attacked by this Canaanite king. <laughs> Oh, well, because they're used to it. There's a thing called habit entering in here, and the people who put numbers together are talking about habit. Every time something went wrong, no matter what the nature of it was, and there are diverse kinds of problems they faced in the 40 years, no matter what the problem is, they always say the same thing. Why didn't you bring us to a land of milk and honey and we don't have any food? That's called habit. They express every annoyance in exactly the same way. And was this particular, are they making any progress? Let me ask you about spiritual progress, because unlike what we're going to find later, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers carry the theology in the story, as I've said many times. Tell me from looking at the story here, whether or not they're making any progress. Weren't they upset also? Well, I th yeah, I think they were. I think they were annoyed at that. They would like to have just uh, fought with Edom. I think there's a lot of contributing factors right at this point to make somebody annoyed. I don't think that their annoyance was particularly difficult to understand, and I think it's even when I say understandable, almost excusable to be annoyed under these circumstances. But the annoyance issues forth in the usual result. Uh, Moses is doing something wrong. God is doing something wrong. Now remember, you must understand that part of the theology of these stories is they don't have any evidence other than Moses' 
statement that God is telling him to do the various things he does. Do you remember what happened, what the story was? And, and De Deuteronomy is going to dwell on this for a long time and make theological implications about it. The idea was that they heard God speaking and said what? We let him talk to you when he's too much for us. We don't want to hear what he says. We'll die. You talk to him and tell us what he says. So from that point forward, what do you have? You have simply Moses saying, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to do this because God says, tells me to do this. God's told me to do that. For 40 years, Moses has been saying, we're going to do this and that because God says so. And this entire generation has grown up listening to Moses say, well, well God is telling me this. That's how. Remember, these people weren't adults. They were children or they didn't exist, weren't even born at, at Sinai, right? So they have to take everything on Moses' say so. So it's very easy, very easy then, for this generation to do what? Yeah. Equate Moses with God. If, if Moses said, this is what God says, it's Moses who's saying it. All right? So the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no food, no water, and we loathe this worthless food. <coughs> yes, 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 we know, we know all that. <laughs> so you said, there, there was, yes, that's right. This is, this is what they grew up with. This is what their parents said. Um, fortunately, Moses is beyond going berserk every time this is said, right? Even Moses was making spiritual progress. God didn't have to say to Moses, let me alone so that I can destroy them so that Moses can say, don't do that, right? At this point, it's not all that serious. It really isn't that serious. Why? The first thing that God does, and he doesn't strike down 14,000 of them, right? No fire burns at the edge of the camp. 12,000 people don't die with quail in their throats. Something relatively minor happens. Snakes, which are endemic to the area, start biting people and causing a fever or inflammation. That's what fiery serpent means. They're not even fatalities. This is, this is dealing with the problem in, in measure, all right? Now, apparently they had gotten used to God's protection where they're well, they didn't have a problem with snakes, and now they have the normal problem with snakes that you would have. Okay? So, now, they di now people are being bitten, and some people are dying. Nobody has said anything. They've begun to murmur the usual thing. They're saying the usual thing to each other. People begin to get bitten by snakes. They're having fevers. Some of them are dying as a result of these snake bites. And it dawns on people. They don't have a big showdown at the sanctuary, right? There's not a big deal. The people make the connection what? This is happening because, yeah, because of our complaining. That was a sin. So they go to Moses and they say, without a big fight to see who's going to kill who, we sinned, for we spoke against Yahweh and against you. So pray to Yahweh that he will take these serpents from us. Well, I like it. Why do I like it? Well, it's better. Yes, and you should read it as better. It's a lot better. In him and in his connection and, and, the nat and that these natural consequences are under God's control. And... The Biblical Archaeology Review a couple of years ago had a beautiful brass serpent. Uh, the Midianites worshipped brass serpents. And well, you can imagine, being na a nature religion, the thing they had polished it, the bronze was still gleaming, and they twined them around poles. And they set them up on poles in their oases, and that was the god of the stakes to pray to please don't bite us. So he used the pagan symbol from the area and said now here's what you need to do you you don't need to worship this like you're like the pagans that you're meeting at these oases what you make this serpent set on a pole if a serpent bites a man what 
look at the serpent and you'll look. Now, an interesting thing about this, what did they ask Moses to do? Pray. Yes, pray what? <laughs> but they didn't pray for the rest of it. They prayed that no more be bitten. Yeah, we don't want any more snake bites. Take the snakes away from us. But God's expecting them at this point to stand on their own two feet. They didn't get rid of this serpent. Hezekiah finally had it ground up because he found people worship were worshiping it. They had it in the temple. They never got rid of it. It became a pagan idol eventually. Uh, if it had pagan roots. That's why we can't get too, 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 too worried about steeples and things. Christmas trees. And Christmas trees, yes. Because, I mean, there's the brass serpent and lots of other things like it. Now, God at this point expected them to stand on their own two feet. He expected them to be adults. He didn't take the snakes away. From now on, snakes that you find in the desert are what? Are part of... Routine. Yeah, that's going to be from now on. If you pick up a rock and there's a snake on it and it bites you, that's going to happen. But what? Just go look at the serpent, show, show your faith in my word, and uh, <laughs> through Moses, the, the narrator is telling us, their faith in, in God's word through Moses, and nothing will happen. All right? Well, Moses is the covenant mediator. He's the intercessor in all these Moshite stories. Uh, and they set out, Israel set out and encamped in Oboth. From Oboth they encamped in the ruins on the east side, in the wilderness opposite Moab, toward the east. They set out and camped in the valley of the Zered. So, Zia Abarim is south of the Zered. A comment from uh, you know that I don't read very much, but from Aharoni's. Uh, the land of the Bible, or its historical geography. Um, about places and place names. When discussing a particular place or region in light of its biblical references, we must always keep in mind the extent of its representation in the Bible generally. Even if the place under consideration is in a central area, one cannot draw decisive conclusions from silence on the part of the biblical narrative. A place is being mentioned or not mentioned may be purely accidental. Besides incidental references of a general nature, the Bible also contains some specifically geographical texts, the majority of which have been taken from everyday administrative and governmental records and woven into the historical narrative. There are also a few documents which were eminently composed for the purpose of geographical historical description. For instance, the Table of the Nations, Genesis 10. However, we can seldom be certain on this point. Various passages are considered by different scholars to be purely utopian or literary creations, having no political, geographical, or practical basis whatsoever. We seriously question the validity of this opinion. It appears that most of our geographical texts are taken from life situations, while our only our faulty understanding and insufficient information prevent us from establishing their historical context. You get what he's saying there? Understand what he's saying? Modern scholarship with its documentary hypothesis and its evolutionary presupposition is saying that a lot of these places we can't find and we don't know what it's about, therefore what? Imaginary. It's just imaginary. They're, they're, they're inserting back to the past what they think probably happened. All right. From this it is clear that with regard to the understanding of our geographical text in the Bible, 
Their utilization as historical geographical sources depends on two decisive questions. One, what was the list's primary function? And two, what was the date of its composition? From whence was the document taken and was it originally used for the same purpose for which it has been inserted into the historical narrative? Does it really belong in the period to which it has been assigned by the biblical writer? Inasmuch as these are not epigraphic texts whose date can be established by paleographic considerations but are rather literary historical compositions which have passed through the hands of many editors and copyists. We've gotten used to that, seeing that working by now, haven't we? We have no other way but to evaluate the various documents according to their structure and content, disregarding the framework in which they are found. Neither is the higher critical division of biblical sources in vogue among scholars today of any help to us. Okay? The documentary source hypothesis He's saying doesn't help us on geographical things. Can you name the four sources? Everybody ought to be able to name the four sources. What are the four sources? In order, what are they? <coughs> what are the four sources? J, the Yahweh, E, the Elohist, Yahweh, 10th century, Elohist, 9th century. Who's next? No. D is next. The Deuteronomist time of Josiah, 6th century, and P, the priestly writings, always attributed by liberal scholars to the post-exilic period. That's the classical documentary hypothesis. J, E, D, and P. J, 10th century. E, 9th century. D, Deuteronomist, 6th century. P, post-exilic, 4th century. Of course, we have found the Yahwist and the Elohist in Genesis, but to date them to the 10th and 9th century makes no sense at all. The Deuteronomist and to, the priestly sources don't represent the post-exilic period. Why do they say they're post-exilic? Because they don't represent the situation of the priesthood during the monarchy. But what I'm telling you and have been telling you for three months is that the priestly writings that we have been discussing don't represent the period of the monarchy and the liberal scholar has placed them on the wrong side of the monarchy. What do the priestly writings represent? Mm -hmm. With some late additions, they represent the period of the judges, not the per post-exilic period. Not the 4th century, but the 14th to the 11th century. A thousand years earlier. Okay. Now then, what he's saying here is, neither is the higher critical division, J, E, D, and P, of biblical scholars in vogue among scholars today of any help to us. These geographical texts do not belong to the various documents, quote, which critical scholars distinguish. Instead, they have been taken from more ancient sources and inserted into the historical collections. If we establish, for example, that the descriptions of the tribal inheritances were collected by the Deuteronomist, the person who wrote Deuteronomy, we have proved nothing regarding to the, the original nature of the lists, from whence they were taken and why they were composed. In this instance, two documents from different times were brought into the framework of the book of Joshua in order to serve the same purpose, and from their position in the book we can learn nothing about their original date and function. Hope you're following this. Now, one last paragraph. The question arises as to whether various documents may have undergone a certain amount of editing which would have resulted in omissions or additions. It must be stressed, as far as this problem can be investigated critically by comparison to non-biblical sources or parallel lists in the Bible, it is obvious that the biblical editors treated their ancient sources with great caution, and respect. We already knew that, didn't we? We've seen conflated sources where there was every evidence that they wouldn't drop out a word when they were... when they told the story of the two spies, the only words they dropped out was where the same words appeared in both stories, right? They wouldn't drop one word out of those two different stories about the spies. And here we, he's talking about the use of geographical text. It is obvious that the biblical editors treated their ancient sources with great caution and respect. They doubtless considered their text as being in some sense canonical, being accepted as such 
by their contemporaries. Therefore, any radical changes in the document would weaken its authenticity and authority. That's something I wanted to say, and I wanted to say it at the time we looked at the mingling of the Corridathan and the Byram stories and the mingling of the two spy stories. What does it tell you about our editors? That they wouldn't drop a single word out of either story even though it sometimes gave them conflicting details. What does it tell you about how they regarded the text they were working with? They already regarded it as a sacred text. They already regarded it as the word of God. They knew when they were putting it together and creating a book called Numbers that they were writing the Bible. They knew it. They were gathering together the literary material from the temples and the traditions and putting it into one single unified source for all of Israel, for the, uh, for the entire use of the empire, so that everybody would have a single text, and they knew they were writing a Bible. They considered the text already canonical, that is, already sacred, and no word could be lost. <coughs> That's why we have such so much law. Right? <coughs> How many times do you need to know that the priest gets the thigh? As often as what? As often as you have a literary document that says it, what? You're going to find that out. And to, sometimes they've made it a little easier on themselves. We have we've just gone through a section on the priests and the Levites and how much they get it's more than the book of Deuteronomy says they get and it's less than the book of Leviticus says they get but they made it easier on themselves by doing what? separating off the so that it's not side by side so that it's not so obvious because we read through that section here about the priests what the priest gets and what the Levites get and not one person raised his hand and said but that's a different amount than it says in Leviticus okay yeah so sometimes they made it easier to deal with and other times it, I mean you can't separate out the stories of the twelve spies right that happened at a certain point so what do you got I got two stories so what if you put them together and you've got some differences in detail what are you going to do you can't leave it out. It's the word of God. Could have made a much easier story by leaving some of the conflicting details out. Well, they had two different uh, versions anyway uh, from the, the spies themselves. So I guess they were the same mistake. Uh, well, I think that the uh, I think that the difference arose from two different traditions about what happened. Well, is there more work here than, than just a sense of sacredness or canonicity? It's it's, they're trying to, I don't, I'm not sure the right word, it, it, they're building a uh, sort of central repository of the, the history of the nation. So if there are two versions, as there are about the Battle of Manassas in 1861, you would naturally want to include both views of the battle, the Confederate and the Union view. Uh, you could that's the only way you build an American view. The American view, that's right. And you could not possibly have chosen a more apt illustration because prior to David, in the prior century, one of the judges had already attempted to become king of the northern area. And there's every evidence that there was a northern league centered in Shechem and a southern league centered in Hebron. The, the area was so long and you got around on foot. It, north and south it was so long that they developed a northern and a southern people. Right? In fact, they even made a deal where they were fighting between the northerners were fighting the southerners and they tested the password by how they pronounced the word, remember that? Shibboleth. Yeah, shibboleth. By whether or not they aspirated the S. Now, that's because of geography. There is a natural geographical break between the north and the south, and they developed northerners and southerners. Saul's kingdom was, the, was actually a northern kingdom. 
the Judeans didn't have any real part or interest in Saul's kingdom. That was part of the problem with David. Then David, you remember, found it perfectly possible to become king of Benjamin, Judah, and Simeon, right? And rule the southern area for seven years while the northern group continued to believe that Saul's son was the king, or at least they, there was the fiction that he was the king. He wasn't really. But there was a separate league, and these two were competing. And, and that's... That, that is exactly correct. How are you going to make a Hebrew viewpoint if you've got a northern and a southern reminiscence <coughs> of the spy story? <coughs> what are you going to do? It, it seems like some of the geography is the same way. For example, you have the Battle of Manassas and you have the Battle of Bull Run because the Confederates tended to identify battles by place names while the North tended to concentrate on the rivers which they controlled and name battles that way. And in a lot of places it seems like you have the same thing here. You have place names mixed up with uh, a different view that tends to concentrate on rivers. Oh, uh, everybody in the Northern Kingdom knew where Debon was. So People in the Southern Kingdom called it Debon of Gad because they had to be told where it was. And, and both names are in here. It's like, you know, 500 years from now, someone picks up an American book and reads the phrase, the South shall rise again, and it'll cause all kinds of confusion <laughs> because what are they talking about, the South? I mean, South America? Um, yeah. You know what I mean? Yes. I mean, nobody today would say, well, what do you mean by the South? Well, it says here that this these ruins are on the far side of the Arnon. Well, <laughs> that's an apt description if you live in northern Palestine and the far side of the Arnon is the south. If you live in southern Judah, the far side of the Arnon is... The, <laughs> yes, that's right, the near side. And that, that gives you a hint that if Israel was coming from the south and they were on the far side of the Arnon, the person who wrote that lived in the northern kingdom tells you right there. Uh, and we know that all of the people who did the writing lived west of the Jordan. Why? Because they tell you that all of this stuff happened over the Jordan. That's not Moses' writing. Because <laughs> one thing we know for sure about Moses was what? <laughs> he, he, he never got to the far side to call says Jordan over the Jordan. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. Um, Yes, but both things are working, John. They have to get a unified view where the whole idea of the empire would collapse. They have to have a single unified Yahwist religion that they all could ascribe to and say, this is the religion we ascribe to. On the other hand, they, it's not just politics that says we can't leave any of this out. It's what? Religion. This religion. Yeah. Which to them was ancient history. These are the stories about the patriarchs. Okay, now in, in 1000 BC, when you think of, we, we dug the whole place up and we're still digging it up. Okay, and we're computerizing it, which they had no possibility of doing. We're digging the whole place up and computerizing it. They, did, they couldn't do that. We've got printing. We've got it all in books that we can refer to which they couldn't do. They had to write this all out longhand. They had traditions about Abraham from 1900 B.C. It's 1000 B.C. That's 900 years ago. You going to mess around with the story? No. It was already canonical. Yeah. When you think the people in David's time were dealing with an ancient text that was already canonical, it's awesome. There's nothing like it. There's nothing else like it. All right, now then, where are we here? Oh yes, they were they were they were moving around here. Uh, we were in verse uh, twenty-one ten. 
in the wilderness opposite Moab toward the sunrise, and there they set out and encamped in the valley of the Zered. From there they set out and they camped on the other side of the Arnon, which is in the wilderness that extends from the boundary of the Amorites, for the Arnon is the boundary of Moab between Moab and the Amorites. Wherefore it is said in the book of the wars of Yahweh, and their casual reference to these things, it drives me crazy. <laughs> Couldn't they put a footnote and say, we'll append that book to this one so you can read it? <laughs> uh, Wahib and Sufa, this is probably the Suf that's mentioned in Deuteronomy 1. We don't know where this is. And the valleys of the Arnon, and the slope of the valleys that extend to the Sea of Ar and leads to the borders of Moab. Uh, <laughs> There's something interesting about that quotation. It has no verb. Either the verb part of the sentence was in the was in the quote from the book of the wars of the Lord. They didn't transfer the verb into this quote, or else the verb has dropped out since. What do you think the verb was? What would be an appropriate verb for this sentence? Well, it's a quote, uh, people are speaking about themselves. We, you want to say, we camped in Wahab and Sufa in the valleys of the Arnon, in the slope of the valleys that extends to the sea of Ar and leans on the borders of Moab, or we traveled. One scholar I consulted said, suggested we, we traveled this way, or we passed through this way. Another suggested maybe if it's the book of the wars of the Lord, that saying we camped there wouldn't be a good place, way to say it we fought how about we conquered the missing verb by most scholars accounts since it's the book of the wars of the Lord is we conquered Wahab and Sufa and the valleys of the Arnon and the slope of the valleys that extends to the seat of Ar and leads to the borders of Moab okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> you wouldn't memorialize it in the book of the words of the Lord <laughs> yes. alright so I think here we can safely add some words without adding to the text and getting the curse in Revelation <laughs> uh, Revelation is just quoting Deuteronomy from adding and subtracting Deuteronomy 13 1. and from there they continue to the well the well of which Yahweh said to Moses Gather the people together and I will give them water. Now that sounds like it's going to be a miracle, but they're digging this well. Mm -hmm. Then Israel sang this song, and here we have a snatch of a ballad. Spring up, O well, sing to it, the well which the princes dug, which the nobles of the peoples delved with the scepter and with their staves. At least we have a verb. One scholar said that the two interesting things about these two quotations, the most interesting things about them is how little they reveal. All they do is raise all sorts of questions that we'd like to have answers to, and they don't, <laughs> they don't tell us much, but they raise a lot of questions. All right, is, is this a ritual digging of a well which the princes do? Is this here because it was the first well dug in the covenant land? Does this switch from the miraculous giving of water or, or using oasis water of springs to actually digging wells, and maybe that's why they memorialized it? These are guesses that have been suggested. And from the wilderness they went to Matna, and from Matna to Nahaliel, and from Nahaliel to Bema. These, that just means high places, right? <coughs> They're usually cursed in the Old Testament. And from Bema to the valley lying in the region of Moab by the top of Pisgah, which looks down on the desert. So, that's, that's one of these Juts of the mountains out over this area. See, the mountains are 2,200 feet high, these ridges. And they drop off, because it's a, it's a rift, they drop off suddenly into a place that's 1,000 feet below sea level. So you can just go to the edge and you look down 3,000 feet and you can look 40 or 50 miles 
It's a, it's a very dramatic, dramatic. And of course, you look over to the bottom range opposite. Okay. Uh, so. I'm, I'm looking at the statue of uh, the city of Portapu Mountain, and I can't believe that, I mean, the actual city, they, they find nothing, no cities away from them. The King Herod built a palace at Masada. It's a famous site because the last holdout of the defenders of the temple in, Ju in Jerusalem in AD 70 fled there. And they held out at the top of this thing for three years. When, when you're reading about it, you think, you, you kind of visualize that until you really see a picture of this huge mountain yeah. and all the ravines and... It's right there facing the Dead Sea yeah. and you can see about 50 miles from there up the Dead Sea Palace right on the edge. Part of the cliff has fallen away so to get down to the lower palace you have to go on something that has been riveted into the cliff that is a basically a fire escape. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing between you and the earth below, but but the uh, air. <laughs> and if there's enough folks going down with you, and it begins to go like this, <laughs> it's not a place to have acrophobia. <laughs> My thought was, but it would be such a dramatic death. <laughs> 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 it's so memorable. Uh, yes. The, another place that's like that is the... They built a monastery on the side of a cliff in the same area here, overlooking Jericho, on the mouth of the temptation. Uh, Masada's right about here. This, this place is up here, overlooking Jericho. And it's up. I mean, it's just on a tiny little cliff built up like the the Pueblos on the side of the cliffs in, in, in Colorado. And this thing has to be at least 3,000 feet up on a sheer cliff. I mean straight down. And you walk along the edge and there's a, of course a, a stone wall, but it's just stones that have been, and, and they have whitewash over there. <laughs> in a country that has earthquakes all the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know that some monks have gone over in times past, but anyway. How did, how did we get on to, what did you say anyway? What did she say to come me on to this? What did, what did she say? I was just looking at a book this afternoon and I saw that they actually built these cities up on this high mountain. Yes, they did. And so it was showing the excavation. And I used to think, well, how did these cities get buried? Maybe all the dust came, but they were up on the mountain and in the cave. What was the what were the two considerations for where you would build? There were two considerations. What were they? Water, water and defense. Yeah. And yeah, well, okay. So make one sentence out of it. Defense of the water supply. Yeah. That presumes the water's there. Yeah, but well, it was showing the cistern too. So and the cistern had a hole in it, so that when the flood waters came, it filled. It was filled it up. So you can see the difference between living water and cistern water. It, it, after a while, you drank this cistern water, which was dank, and they talk about bitter water and it's green, you know. And, no, really, it's green. You have to sort of spread the stuff aside, pull the... They must boil, they must boil. I mean, they had some mini-tall practices. They must boil the water. Uh, yeah, then of course, no, obviously the living water being spring water would be much more desirable. You go, it's clear, it's cold, it's wonderful by comparison, yeah. Uh, yeah, now, let's see, where are we here? Um, yeah, yeah uh, verse 21. Then Israel sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites. There's another contrast to the Edomites saying, let us pass through your land. And this is an especially good contrast because the same request is made, almost identical. We will not turn aside to field or vineyard. We will not drink your water well. We will go by the king's highway until we pass through your territory. And Zion would not allow Israel to pass through his territory. He gathered all his men together and went out against Israel to the wilderness. And they came to Jehaz and fought against Israel. 
and Israel slew him with the edge of the sword and took possession of his land from the Arnon to the Jabbok. The Jabbok is just off the top of this map here. As far as uh, as far as to the Am Ammonites, for Jazer was the boundary of the Ammonites, and Israel took all these cities, and Israel settled in the cities of the Amorites, in Heshbon, and all its villages, for Heshbon was the city of Sion, the king of the Amorites, who had fought against the former king of Moab and taken all his land out of his hand. Amorites just means west Westerners, as far as the Arnon. Therefore the ballad singers say, so what had happened here was, part of Moab, the northern part of Moab, was now occupied by a, an invader who had conquered the northern Moabites and was ruling the cities and villages of that area from Heshbon. Okay. Therefore the ballad singers say, come to Heshbon, let it be built, let the city of Sion be reestablished. For fire went forth, see this is a taunt, we dare you to do this. For the fire went forth from Heshbon, flame from the city of Sion. It devoured Ar of, of Moab, the, uh, the Arnon, the lords of the city of Moab, the lords of the heights of the Arnon, Woe to you, O Moab, you are undone, O people of Chemosh, that's the national god. He has made his sons fugitives and his daughters captives to an Amorite king, Sihon. So the Paris, posterity perished from Heshbon as far as Debon. But we laid waste until fire spread to Madaba. Okay, so they were conquered again, this time by the Hebrews. Yes. Is the yeah. <coughs> Mm -hmm. And just south of it is Madaba. These are all cities of Moab. And this area had been taken over by these Amorites. And now the Amorites were driven out so that they could be taken over by the Hebrews. And the curse is still on the Moabites because they don't get the land back. <laughs> right, so what they've done then is They've gone up along here and they come in. Alright? <coughs> Thus Israel dwelt in the land of the Amorites, and Moses sent to spy out Jazer, and they took his villages and dispossessed the Amorites that were there. <coughs> then they turned and went up by the way to Bashan. And Og, the king of Bashan, came out against them. They're going north now. <clears throat> he and all his people to battle at Edrei. But Yahweh said to Moses, Do not fear him, for I have given him into your hand and all his people and his land. And you shall do to him as you did to Sion, king of the Amorites, who dwelt at Heshbon. So they slew him and his sons and all his people until there was not one survivor left to him, and they possessed his land. Do you get the sense of the words, the end, being written. Now, we're skipping, for the moment, the Balaam cycle. 22, 23, 24, 25 now. Let's go to 25. Why are we doing that? We'll see. Verse 1. While Israel dwelt in Shittim, the people began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab. We, we left them in Moab, in northern Moab. These invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel yoked himself to the Baal of Peor. And the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Israel, and Yahweh said to Moses, Take all the chiefs of the people and hang them in the sun before Yahweh, and the fierce anger of Yahweh may turn away from Israel. And Moses said to the judges of Israel, Every one of you slay his men who have yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor. Now that's that story. It's gotten intermingled with another story. That's not surprising, is it? Mm -hmm. This one was about Moabite and the Baal of Peor. 
Mount uh, Peor. Okay. Now this other one is about Midianites. Why would Midianites be in the story? Because they're on a road that leads down where? What is this area right down here? Midian. That's Midian. Midian. Not far away. So, uh, one of the people of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman to his family. In the sight of Moses, in the sight of the whole congregation of the people of Israel. While they were weeping at the door of the tent of meeting. To his family is an interpretation of Cuba. What does it really mean? It means the, the domed tent, the phrase used for the sacred tent, the tent of meeting, the sanctuary in other places. Um, so what does that say if we translate Cuba to mean not to the bosom of his family but to the, to the inner room of the sanctuary? What is it saying that the man did? into the tabernacle. What is the significance of the in, in the sight of Moses? Well, he's defying God through Moses, yes. <clears throat> While they were weeping at the door of the tent of meeting, when Phineas, the son of Eliezer, son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose and left the congregation and took a spear in his hand and went after the man of Israel into the inner room. Yeah, the, their presence in the sanctuary is what's described here. And pierced both of them, the man of Israel and the woman, through her body. Uh, thus the plague was stayed for the people of Israel. Now, you do see that you have two stories here that have been placed in relation to each other. Hmm? This was temple prostitution. That's exactly what it was. Mm -hmm. Yes. But it's about a Midianite. Well, she was a Midianite priestess. And therefore related to Moses' wife. Which was an especial affront to Moses. Um, this story doesn't have a beginning. The story of the Baal of Peor has been made its beginning, which is a Moabite story. As this is happening, what is going on? A plague is going on. Have we heard about a plague? N not a word about a plague, yes. We break in at verse 6 into the middle of a story. They had a story without a beginning. They had, yes, and they had a story... Well, it has an ending. Take the, take the men and hang them up. But it's not a real dramatic ending, so what? Yeah, yeah. So they put it in front of the story about the Midianites and made what? One made one story out of it. But, you know, verse 1, though, it started to assume that something was happening in relation to that, too, because uh, Israel started to play the part. Oh, there's a kind of an inner thing about... Uh, some sort of orgiastic rite yeah. at the Baal of Peor and then this person comes in with uh, sexual relations inside the sanctuary and there's, there's some sort of relationship. The thing that I want you to catch is that the story in 25 verses 1 to 5 is complete unto itself. Verse 6 begins a new story but it's not the beginning of the story, it's missing and so they just put them together to give you a whole story. Uh, when he went into the inner room, and, and again, the Kuba is the sanctuary, pierced both of them, the man of Israel, in fact, these dome tents with a sacred shrine inside that the Arabs used, that word is used to this day, uh, pierced both of them, the man of Israel and the woman, through her body. Thus the plague was stayed, nevertheless those that died of the plague were 24,000. So something was going on that had to do with Midianites, Temple prostitution of some sort. Is that number legit? Well, this is a book entitled Numbers. <laughs> and the problem is that it's put together by folks 
who've inherited obviously some numbers. And they obviously didn't know what the numbers meant. But they were forced to do something with it because the whole theology is about numbers, as we're about to see. The whole cycle is about numbers. So what did they have to do? When they came on numbers, yes, they had to assign it some numerical value. What did the original number, every time we come to a number in the book of numbers, I have to say, we can't be sure that the number is the correct number. I mean, I know we talked about that at the very beginning, and then we just kind of, kind of, kind of glossed over the other numbers. No, I, what we said at the very beginning holds for every number we come to. Th this is a book put together with very early traditions about the Exodus, from the time of the empire when they didn't know what the numbers meant. It's that simple. Now, back to Phineas. He always said to Moses, Phineas the son of Elias, the son of Aaron the priest, has turned back my wrath from the people of Israel, in that he was jealous with my jealousy among them, so that I did not consume the people of Israel in my jealousy. Therefore say, Behold, I give to him my covenant of peace, it shall be to him and to his descendants after him the covenant of a perpetual priesthood because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the people of Israel. And it's pretty clear to me by just the way it's stated that Phineas was not the elder son of Eliezer. He's presented as the next high priest and the elder in all the genealogies. Now, why? Because he became by this action the next high priest. He inherited the priesthood by his action, and it's very clear that there was someone else, someone of his brothers, who didn't take action and lost the high priesthood as a result. Here Moses in action is, is detailed. This is an Aaronite story anyway. It's not Moses who quells the orgy, it's Aaron's family who has to do it. And after all, Moses is in embarrassment because it's a Midianite. Right? And hadn't Aaron warned him about this Midianite priestess he had for a wife? Hmm. Now, <clears throat> the covenant of perpetual priesthood because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the people of Israel. Here the atonement is made by offering as sacrifice, by offering as blood sacrifice, Defenders. Yes, the offenders. the offenders, yes, that's right. The name of the slain man of Israel who was slain with the Midianite woman was Zimri, the son of Salo, head of the father's house belonging to the Simeonite, head of a father's house. So he was... A he was a clan chief, yeah. And the name of the Midianite woman who was slain was Cosby, the daughter of Zur, who was the head of the people of a father's house in Midian, another clan chief which is uh, what's especially offensive about it. And, and in other words, this wasn't nobody's. These were leaders among their people. Mm -hmm. And Yahweh said to Moses, Harass the Midianites and smite them, for they have harassed you with their wiles, which they beguiled you in the matter of Peor, in the matter of Cosby. Ha! <laughs> to, make, to make it work, what did the editors have to do? Peor. You got, had to insert Peor to make a whole story here. You see, of course, if you leave the, uh, the matter of Peor out, they have beguiled you in the matter of Cosby. It follows from the story we've been reading. The daughter of the prince of Midian, their sister, who was slain on the day of the plague on account of Peor. <laughs> Editors are allowed to make editorial brackets to make it flow. Do you understand what they did? <laughs> All right, now then for you. After the plague, now the plague came from this Midianite story. After the plague, Yahweh said to Moses and to Eliezer, the son of Aaron the priest, take a census of all the congregation of the people of Israel from 20 years old and upward by their father's houses, all in Israel who are able to go forth to war, which was the order at Kadesh just before they were going to attack at Kadesh. Now in the same words, the order comes here in Transjordan. And we've got to think of what? 
Am I going the right way? No, I'm not going the right way. <laughs> am I going the right way now? Going the right way. I am? Okay. <laughs> we have to think of what? Cycle. Our cycles. And the, the, the beginning is the end and the end is the beginning. As numbers was originally constructed, Barney, the whole idea is that the census marked the beginning of the war and because they blew it, they went through a whole cycle and what? Came back to the census. Now, God was going to have all those people die. According to the theology of the book, and we've seen thousands upon thousands die because of sin, this way and that and the other, according to the theology of the book, we started out with, what was it, 601,550? We better end with what? 601,550 or more. One less would be what? Sin and triumph. Right? The whole theology of the book as it was originally written was that all of this disaster through that cycle did not what? Affect the outcome. Yes. Okay. So now what do we got here? Reuben grows smaller Simeon grows much smaller. Simeon's losing place rapidly and eventually disappears. Gad grows smaller. Judah grows larger. That's not a surprise, is it? Issachar grows larger. One of the in Zebulun grows larger. The leading, these leading tribes of the Northern League. Manasseh grows larger. Ephraim, interestingly, Ephraim grows smaller. Benjamin grows larger. Dan grows larger. Asher grows larger. Naphtali grows smaller. Verse 51, this was the number of the people of Israel, 601,730. And Yahweh said to Moses, to these the land shall be divided for an inheritance among the number of names to a large tribe you shall give a large inheritance and to a small tribe you shall give a small inheritance every tribe shall be given its inheritance according to its numbers but the land shall be divided by lot according to the names of the tribes of their fathers they shall inherit their inheritance shall be divided according to lot between the larger and the smaller then you remember that the original census didn't remember what we did we divided Joseph into Ephraim and Manasseh to get 12 but we right after we counted the 12 tribes by doing that we counted the Levites right go back to the beginning of the book you'll see that these are the Levites it's numbered according to their families Gershon of the Gershonites Kohath the Kohathites Merari the Merarites and um, verse 58 of families of the Levi, the family of the Libnites, the family of the Hebronites, the family of the Malites, the family of the Mushites, the family of the Korahites. Kohath, the father of Amram, Amram's wife of Jochebed, the daughter of Levi, who was born to Levi in Egypt. She bore to Amram Aaron and Moses and Miriam, their sister. And if you read it that way, notice how this um, genealogy does it. How long are they in Egypt? Is that what this genealogy says? What does it say? There was Levi, the patriarch, who went to Egypt, and what? <laughs> there was Levi, right? The Jochebed was the daughter of Levi, who was born to Levi in Egypt, and she bore to Amram, Aaron, Moses, and Miriam, their sisters. So by doing this, Moses and Aaron and Miriam are Levi's Grand. grandchildren. Remember I told you about the tendency of genealogies to leave out the center? Except been a long time ago since we talked about a Syrian king list A and B. That's still on tape? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. All right. 23,000, every male amount folded upward. <clears throat> now verse 63, and get it. Get this now. These were those numbered by Moses and Eliezer the priest who numbered the people of Israel in the plains of Moab by the Jordan at Jericho. 
But among these there was not a man of those numbered by Moses and Aaron the priest who had numbered the people of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai. For Yahweh had said of them, They shall die in the wilderness. There was not a man of them except Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. To which we say, The end. This was the book of Numbers originally. We've now read it. The Balaam cycle is something else, and this case is the law for his daughters. Okay. Selection of Joshua, which appears again in Deuteronomy and Joshua, is in, inserted here. The daily burnt offering, offering for the Sabbath, new moon, feast of unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, feast of trumpets, day of atonement, offering for the tabernacle, and vows, another appendix on vows, just like at the end of Leviticus, and the destruction of the Midianites, which is part of the conclusion of the story of Balaam, which is how it got mixed in here, and the settlement of Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh, which all appears again in greater detail in Joshua. Mm -hmm. And the whole, Numbers 33, the whole itinerary of every single place they stopped in 40 years. Okay. All the boundaries of the land, every single tribe's full boundary by every hill and road and valley and rock in the whole country. So you can find out exactly where every single boundary was. And every single Levitical city and every single city of refuge. And a repeat of the story about the Lafayette's daughters that Harris, Harris can inherit. All of that is appendices that have become accretions to the book. Destroying its original perfect symmetry of a single cycle. From the first census through all the rebellions to the second census without the loss of a single person without the weakening of Israel as Israel at all. So the book of Numbers really was the book of Numbers originally because the theology was about the numbers. Even though they couldn't interpret them prob properly, the numbers were a big deal. Th they were the point. Right? Is, is everybody with me on this? Okay. Now, we have some appendices that grew on the end, a whole pile of them. And we have this whole cycle about Balak and Balaam that was inserted. This is a whole story, a whole little book. This is a little book. An interesting little book uh, about this man Balaam. And it has a beginning, a middle, an end, and a theology, and a moral. But because it happened in Moab, what, have they, what has someone later done with it? Inserted it into the Book of Numbers without regard for the original plan of the Book of Numbers. <laughs> Is that all right? Yes. Um, I would have liked to have it like the Book of Ruth which was appended to Judges outside, but left as a little book all by itself, standing sweetly off to itself. It kind of destroys the book of Ruth to be st stuck in the middle of the Judges, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's so nice. The Judges is so rotten. <laughs> um, could, it, could it be that some of these appendices are some of the books that were referred to? Well, there aren't... There, no. They're not poetry. There's no pieces of poetry about the wars of the Lord. There's no pieces of poetry about uh, digging wells or anything like that. There's no ballads. Good try. <laughs> the book of the wars of the Lord. Uh, yeah except that Joshua shunts it off, shunts off its poetry to the book of Jasher. <laughs> it gets its poetry from the book of Jasher. And we don't know that that's a different book or what, but anyway, it's got its extra biblical thing there too. Mm -hmm. All right, so we come to a natural conclusion. Now, of course, following our policy, we won't let Balaam slide. 
We'll read the book of Balaam all the way through and we'll read about Zelophehad's daughters and we'll even read Numbers 33. <laughs> Didn't we promise somewhere along the way to read every verse? Every verse. <laughs> yeah. Now listen, we found out that the genealogies in Genesis were great fun, did we not? Great fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way I choose to remember it. <laughs> and we'll have just as much fun reading Numbers 